Luckily, it's very easy for Americans to remember Charles Darwin's dates because he had the good fortune, at least in terms of our memories, to be born on the very same day as Abraham Lincoln, February 12th, 1809. I mean the very same day, not just the same date. He was 50 years old when he published The Origin of Species in 1959, and that nice coincidence of the 50th birthday celebration and the publication of the great book pretty much sets up the tempo of Darwinian celebrations. So 1909 was the centenary of his birth and the 50th anniversary of the origin. And 1959, which was a time of great Darwin celebrations, was the 100th anniversary of the origin of species. And as you are separating, I think they're called sesquicentennials, the 150th anniversary of his birth. I used to collect stamps. That's how you learn what the 50, 150, 200, et cetera are called. Now, there were some wonderful parties in 1959. That was a great time of celebration. They were held all over the world. The biggest one in the United States was held in Chicago. And I think the only rain that fell on that particular parade in 1959 was a wonderful address delivered by the great American geneticist H.J. Muller and entitled 100 years without Darwin are enough. That's an interesting speech if you read it because he's not talking about what you might think. That is one can talk a lot about the lack of acceptance of evolution itself and American popular culture, the issue of creationism. And Muller mentioned that but that wasn't the main thing he was talking about. What he wanted to talk about was the lack of understanding of what Darwin's theory actually entailed, not only among people who are perfectly comfortable with the notion that evolution had obviously and factually occurred, but even among people who call themselves Darwinians. And that puzzled him that a theory so widely accepted and honored should be so badly understood. And he wanted to know why. Now look, evolution has become generally known. Let me make the same distinction Darwin made all the time in his writing. Darwin very keenly pointed out again and again that he had tried to do two quite distinctly separate things in his writings about this subject. First was simply to convince the world that evolution had occurred. That is the documentation of the fact of evolution. And in that he was abundantly successful. Darwin lies in Westminster Abbey for his success in having demonstrated to the thinking world that evolution had occurred. We'll come back to that at the very end. Secondly, Darwin said he was also also trying to propose a mechanism for how evolution worked. And he came up with the theory, the theory of natural selection. And these are quite different things. That is, one can be fully satisfied that evolution occurred and not like natural selection as a mechanism or not understand natural selection as a mechanism. So I want to point out that I'm talking about this second part today. Charles Darwin's revolution and thought, look, it's revolutionary enough just to find out that evolution happened. But I want to focus on the other part, that is the revolutionary implications of Darwin's own theory for how evolution works, namely the theory of natural selection. And I, I'll tell you where I'm going. I basically want to propose the reason why it hasn't been well understood is not that it's particularly difficult, but really that it's philosophically so radical that even though in a sense it's easy to understand, we don't want to. So we've managed to avoid it. Now, when faced with Muller's dilemma, namely, here's a theory that's well accepted by the scientific community, it's 100 years old, why don't people grasp it? or understand it very well, the first thing you might think is a hypothesis, and it would be perfectly reasonable. Maybe natural selection is very difficult. Uh, that would be my first pass guess if faced with that problem. Is a theory has been around for 100 years, it's accepted by virtually all professionals, yet it's not widely represented correctly. Why don't people, maybe it's very hard. That can't be true. The theory of natural selection is easy. So it can, the obvious explanation, namely maybe it's very hard and that's why people don't get it, can't be right. The theory of natural selection is really pretty simple, at least in terms of its bare bones mechanics. Uh, I, I don't want to give a lecture about the content of natural selection, but while I'm on the topic, let me just express to you how simple it is. I can run it by you in a couple of minutes. That can't be the reason why it's poorly understood. Basically, and it's just the bare bones mechanics, the implications are rich and varied and difficult, but as the bare bones mechanics of the theory, it's simplicity itself. Three facts that no one can deny in a simple, almost syllogistic inference. 
And this is how it's usually presented pedagogically, and that's right. First fact, that all organisms produce more offspring than can possibly survive. That's clearly true, and Darwin goes to great lengths to show that. Fact number two, all organisms vary within a species. Just look around the room, that's folk wisdom, it's obvious. Fact number three, because you need it for a genealogically based theory, that at least some of that variation is inherited. And that's also folk wisdom. Sure, Darwin didn't know the mechanism, the world didn't until the Mendelian rediscovery of 1900, but you don't need to know the mechanism. You just need to know that there is a principle of inheritance, and that's folk wisdom. We know that tall parents tend to have tall kids, short parents, short kids, black parents, black children, white parents, white children. We know it is a principle of inheritance, even if we don't know how it works. Take those three facts, overproduction, variation, and inheritance of some of that variation, and natural selection follows as an almost syllogistic inference. If all organisms produce more offspring than possibly survive, on average, as a statistical phenomenon, not every time, on average, those organisms that fortuitously are better adapted to changing local environments will tend to survive better and produce more offspring, and the average of the population will shift in their direction. To cite a somewhat caricatured example, but it's not grossly off, you have a population of elephants in Russia, the ice is advancing, there's variation in the amount of hair on elephants, elephants that are a little more hairy on average will do better. The hairiest one might still fall down a crevasse and die, but as a statistical statement, on average, they'll do better in surviving and reproduction, and a hundred generations down the line, you'll have a woolly mammoth. That's what natural selection is. It's a principle of adaptation to changing local environments. It's not hard. So why then do we have this odd phenomenon that a hundred years, and it's just as true today as when Muller said in 1959, that now close to 200 years after the promulgation of the theory of natural selection, it's still so poorly understood. And I would propose to you, it is the basis of this talk, that the reason must be, in a, in a sentence, that it is philosophically so radical, it stands against so many of the traditional social hopes and psychological biases of our culture that we really just don't want to face them, and therefore have tried to put a different kind of spin on natural selection, that we can read it more in the light of those biases, which makes it something other than what Darwin intended, something that almost distorts it into its opposite. The way in which I will structure this talk, because it's worked for me in the past, will be a, first a statement or a paradox, and then three riddles, which I'll attempt to resolve. There are three riddles about Darwin's life, and in the resolution of each of the riddles, we can understand one of the radical features of Darwin's theory. The first paradox I want to discuss is how can I call Darwin a, a revolutionary thinker if in an old tradition of his biography he wasn't a very smart guy at all. I want to dispense with that quickly. And then I'll take up these three riddles in sequence. My first one is going to be who was the naturalist on board HMS Beagle. And the answer obviously is not Darwin or I wouldn't be posing it. I don't uh, think I'm getting more radical than uh, I wish to be. I'm not going to tell you Darwin wasn't on the ship for five years. He was, but he wasn't the official naturalist. And in there lies a fascinating story which reflects and illustrates one of the radical features of the theory. Secondly, why did Darwin not use the word evolution? That's what we call a process today, but he never describes it as such, and there's an interesting reason for that. Thirdly, why, having developed the theory of natural selection in 1838, being fully aware of its very large implications and being certainly ambitious enough to want credit for it, why did Darwin wait 21 years in order to publish it? Why this delay? It's an old question in Darwinian historiography. And I think in the resolution, or the best resolution, of those three riddles, we can illustrate best the three most radical characteristics, philosophically radical characteristics, of the theory of natural selection.